My name is Sidney Decker. I, uh, I'm a professor at Griffith University. And for the past 20 years, uh, I have studied why things go wrong. Why a patient dies of a medication overdose in a hospital, for example, or why an airliner crashes. So why do things go wrong? Well, we used to believe that things go wrong because somebody makes an error or something breaks. Today, however, we believe, and we have since the mid or late 1980s, that things go wrong because lots of things, lots of little things, larger things, inside the organization are wrong, have been wrong for a long time. These are things related to procedures, culture, design of equipment, supervision, work practices, and all these things can combine to create the potential for an accident. Now, this has been an extraordinarily empowering idea. It has shifted the focus upstream to the system surrounding the work that people do. We now expect organizations to have vast systems in place that are all supposed to look for these holes, these little wrongs, and fix them before they can combine to create trouble. The risk becomes that we invest in safety work that focuses on the higher frequency but lower consequence events such as people not wearing their safety glasses or having their coffee in a cup without a lid on it, and that we then mistake low counts on those things as a statement of the general safety health of the process or operation as a whole. So we used to know that we were safe if we had competent managers and people at the sharp end who knew what they were doing. How do we know whether we're safe today? We have the paperwork to show that we are. And then we blow stuff up. How did we end up here? Here's how. We still see people as the problem. We believe that as long as we have great systems in place and that people conform and stay within the narrow bandwidth that we have assigned to them, things will be okay. But this is an illusion, and it is increasingly a dead end. People are not the problem we need to control. People are the solution that we should harness. I don't believe that things go wrong because things go wrong. That's a tautology. It's saying the same thing twice. I believe things sometimes go wrong because they usually go right. Human performance, improvement. The first thing we must understand about human performance is, as humans, we are naturally flawed. It's in our nature to make mistakes when we carry out tasks. Not only are we flawed as human beings, but we are constantly working and surrounding ourselves with systems that are also flawed. Understanding human performance concepts and applying human performance improvement techniques helps us manage and resolve those flaws so they don't have a negative impact on the way we do tasks both on and off the clock. Safety and efficiency. Some of the names of these programs include TQM, ISD, ISM, and OD. Now we have HPI. To some, it's just another industry acronym. However, they all have one very common goal, to diagnose and treat the gap between the actual and desired levels of performance. HPI is unique because it not only reminds us that we need to consider our own human nature and the flawed systems and work environments we place ourselves in, but it takes it one step further by giving the modern worker a tool belt of simple yet proven techniques to help set up a barrier from errors and flaws and how to recognize them and later on how to fix them. Human performance should strongly be taken into consideration when it comes to working in high performing, high risk industries like our own where human error leads to significant events. Some of these industries include transportation, healthcare, 
energy, and even military. The tools and concepts were originally rolled out by those in the nuclear industry. Others quickly caught on and adopted HPI with the help of the Department of Energy. Human performance tools and concepts can be applied to roles of all kinds. Scientists, computer programmers, and engineers, just to name a few. In most workplaces, a small measure of human error is considered acceptable risk. It's an inherent risk that is wholly unavoidable and ultimately inevitable. Todd Conklin, author of Pre-Accident Investigations, tells us that the skilled worker, one who uses their hands, makes an average of five to seven errors per hour. The knowledge worker, one who works only with ideas and concepts, makes even more. They make an average of 15 to 20 errors per hour. So how can this be? We must understand the definition of error. An error is simply an unintentional deviation from the preferred behavior. Not every error results in an event. So there is a difference between errors and events. Oftentimes, errors will go completely unnoticed. And we make errors all day long, yet nothing happens as a result of those errors. According to the Department of Energy, 80% of events in the workplace can be attributed to human error. Only 20% can be attributed to actual equipment failure. If we drill down human error, 70% can be tied to organizational weaknesses. And only 30% is caused by the individual worker who touches the equipment and the systems. Organizational weaknesses are often the cause of human error, and these are the things that have been hiding in our processes possibly since the beginning of the process. Not only do they lie dormant deep within our processes, but they can also be found within our own organizational values, like our shared beliefs, the attitudes we carry, what we consider the norm to be, and the assumptions we make on a daily basis. These are known as latent organizational weaknesses. In other words, it doesn't always have to be a written rule or a process. It's the way we've been doing tasks. It's the culture we've created for ourselves. to organizational weaknesses are flawed controls. These are the other defects we need to consider. These are the things that get in the way of our defensive measures we've put in place to protect our equipment and our safety. When an event occurs, there is either a flaw with our existing control, or even worse, maybe we don't have the appropriate controls in place. Officers are defined by the Department of Energy as unfavorable prior conditions at the job site that increase the probability for error during a specific task. Error precursors are numerous and often inevitable. These can include time pressure, high workload, interruptions, distractions, fatigue, unfamiliarity, stress, mental shortcuts, and complacency. Error precursors can happen in multiples, and when they are aligned at the right time and the right place, an event can occur. So combine error precursors, organizational weaknesses, and flawed controls, and you've got an error-likely situation on your hands. 
Performance modes help us determine which error precursors we're most susceptible to, and it also helps us know which HPI tools will work best. And we can classify the worker in three performance modes. Skill based. This is where you typically use pre programmed sequences of behavior that don't require a lot of conscious control. This can include the use of hand tools, gauges, test equipment, and valves. The biggest error trigger in this mode is inattention. According to the nuclear industry, 25% of errors occur in this mode. Rule-based. This is where you function by applying memorized or written rules to managing certain work situations. Rule-based modes can be thought of as using very simple logic. If a symptom exists, then do this. This is where you match the signs and symptoms of the work situation to some sort of stored knowledge that you already have. Misinterpretation is the most prevalent error precursor to be aware of in this mode. The nuclear industry tells us that 60% of their errors occur in this mode. Knowledge based. This is where you rely on your own understanding and knowledge of the job condition and situation. The activities in this mode often require diagnosing and problem solving. The error precursor to watch out for in this mode, it's lack of expertise. Only 15% of errors occur in this mode according to the nuclear industry. No longer do workers neatly fall into the doer or thinker categories as outlined by Frederick Taylor back in the early 20th century. Workers actually float in and out of all three performance modes during any given day while performing tasks. basic concepts and the principles of human performance and utilizing a variety of HPI tools will help us with some of these challenges. <laughs>